Thank you for joining us for the afternoon gate equity webinar where we explore topics related to education um, and graduation success. This webinar is going to be recorded and it will be posted in the next couple of weeks and the PowerPoint is posted on OSPI on the gate equity webinar page right now. So if you want to follow along, if you want those slides, that's where they are. Uh, also, we'd like to ask that you put your questions in Q&A. You're still allowed to use the chat. Feel free to do that. Um, we are going to run some polls where we're asking your opinion. That's a good place for those, but it's easier for us to track questions if they do come through Q&A. Uh, I'm Kathy Anderson, OSPI Graduation Equity Program Supervisor. Today's topic is mentoring because it's relationships that matter. And Pixie, do you want to talk a little bit about why we chose this topic? Sure, Kathy. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dixie Grunenfelder. I'm the director of K-12 supports here at OSPI. And on behalf of OSPI, I want to thank our presenters today from Communities and Schools. Um, OSPI and Communities and Schools have been um, longstanding partners in building and providing integrated student supports. Uh, we appreciate Communities and Schools for their leadership as a dropout prevention organization working in schools to surround students with a community of supports that empower them to stay in school and achieve in life. I want to acknowledge the state director of communities in schools, Susan Richards, as a founding partner in the GATE initiative, and thank her for introducing us today to the Federal Way Community and Schools affiliate uh, that we'll be presenting. So thank you, Susan, and thank you, communities and schools. Thanks, Dixie. Um, Dixie is our Director of System Improvement here at OSPI. Thank you so much for coming, Dixie. I'm so glad you're here. Um, at OSPI, our vision is all students prepare for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagements. And this GATE webinar is brought to you through the Office of System and School Improvement. Today's topics, um, what we're going to talk about is that we want to share with you the Communities in Schools model effective school-based mentoring strategies, and then we want to share some resources to help get you started. And we're going to kick off today with, we like to check who's in our audience. So we're going to have a poll today um, just to see who's here. So thinking about that. And how familiar uh, are you with communities and schools? So we're going to give just a minute to do that. And as we go, if you want to use that questions box to ask our presenters anything that you want, uh, we will be pausing periodically to answer those questions for you. And we're going to share these results with you so you can kind of see out there. Um, there's some people who don't know a whole lot. Some people have had a mentor. Some people are mentors. And there's a lot of interest in running a mentoring program, so that's really great. And it looks like our other poll fell off. That's okay. We're going to go here. So joining us today, like Dixie said, we have Tracy Oster. She's our executive director from Communities and Schools. Um, Jennifer Rojas Youngblood could not be here today. Um, she is ill and we will miss her, but we do have Eileen Cunningham and she's a former board member with Communities and Schools. Um, do you guys want to talk a little bit about your roles? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to, to be here and talk about Communities and Schools and how mentoring fits, fits into our model. Um, I, my name is Tracy Oster. I am executive director. I've been doing this for 12 years and uh, mentoring really was how we started here in Federal Way um, before we really developed in a full-fledged Communities and Schools affiliate. So we've been doing it for, for quite some time here. Um, so we're happy to be here and happy to answer any questions along the way. And then also with me uh, is Eileen Carnahan and she has been around since, since I was here, since I started as well and was part of the board when we developed our, our school-based mentoring program. And Jennifer there in the middle, unfortunately she's sick, but she is our program manager and she started with us as our mentor program manager and has really helped build the program. So first thing I'm gonna do is just tell you a little bit about communities and schools in general. Um, I, it's too bad we couldn't see that, uh, that last poll and see how many people know about communities and schools. I always like to to find out because it's always interesting to me, the people that do know about it or have heard about it but don't really know. 
Um, but that's okay. So we are a national dropout prevention organization, as Dixie said. We were founded officially in 1977, but really started in, in the 1950s when our founder, Bill Milliken, kind of started on the streets of New York. It was then called Cities, Cities and Schools. Um, we're across the country in 25 states and D.C., uh, 2,300 schools, and we have um, a little over one and a half million students that are served by all our local affiliates. Here in Washington, we were founded in 1991, and as you can see, we have 13 locally managed affiliates. So we've, we've grown quite a bit in the last um, five to seven years, I think, expanding into the east side of the state um, and up north into Whatcom County. Um, we're in 180 schools and serve almost um, 81,000 students across the state. And then here specifically in Federal Way, we, um, we're, we're now serving Federal Way public schools as well as Highline public schools. And we started in 1994 as the Federal Way Chamber of Commerce Education Foundation. And this is sometimes um, when a, a community wants to start a new communities and schools affiliate, they will look to see what organizations are already there doing similar work or, or doing kind of work that aligns with communities and schools. And that's how the Chamber of Commerce Education Foundation came to be communities and schools. There was a transition year, 05 to 06, and then in 2006, we became an official communities and schools affiliate. And Eileen will talk a little bit more about when we first started because she was here um, during that transition. Um, at the time we started, we were in two schools in 2006, and today we're in 14 schools in two different districts. We have over 500 students that are case managed, so they get individual one-to-one -one supports, and then over 8,000 that receive services through school-wide or, or tier one supports. And this is really, this is what, this explains communities and schools. This is what we do. Um, it's our model that was developed by the national office um, based on research and data, and we know that if we if we use this uh, service delivery model and we deliver services with fidelity, that it works. That students will more students will graduate on time, and fewer students will drop out. And you can just see the cycle. And I know this is probably not like rocket science, not news. I mean, there are other organizations that use a similar process, mm -hmm. um, but we place a site coordinator, so a CIS employee, inside a school. Um, and they work with the student or the leadership team, so principals, counselors, um, uh, people that are already in the building, and work to do an assessment. What are the needs? What are the overall needs of the schools, of the school? Um, what are some needs based on what we see in the community? And they do a pretty um, thorough needs assessment. That, um, we talk to a lot of different um, people. We talk to teachers and counselors. We talk to parents and students. We'll look outside into the community and really try to get a thorough assessment of what the needs are. And then the assessment also includes what are the resources. We don't duplicate services. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we'll look and see kind of what services are already out there and which ones that, that students and families can have access to at, at the school site. Um, and then we work with that same um, school team to develop a plan. And the plan is twofold. There is a school-wide plan, so those tier one services. So what is the school-wide goal? Um, off its, often it's attendance to uh, increase attendance or reduce um, behavior incidences. And so we'll help to bring in school-wide services that support um, those goals. And then also part of that planning is to identify the students that need the more intensive, ongoing, integrated student supports. And those kids are referred by teachers, uh, counselors, parents, self-referred. Um, oftentimes we do a lot of basic needs, so they'll come in for a snack, and that's a, kind of an entry point into um, being on our caseload. Um, so they'll work with those students, and those students will develop an individual student support plan. So students set goals, and then our coordinators work with them, and then as you can see, the next step would be monitoring, adjusting, just checking in with the kids, how's it going, is this working, do you need something else? And then just ongoing evaluation, um, looking at things at the end of the year, how did it work, what do we need to change, what do we need to do differently, what can we add, um, and then just repeating the cycle every year. So um, it's the, the thing that I think that really kind of is, is magic is that this, this person, that's their job. I think um, you know, teachers and counselors and principals have so many other things to do that when you have somebody that that's their job to coordinate, you know, um, 
community resources and volunteers and stuff that that really um, helps support the, the whole school and all the kids. So the relationship piece is that was, the, again, that's Bill Milliken, our, the founder of Communities and Schools. It's relationships, not programs that change children. And that's at the core of Communities and Schools, as well as mentoring. Um, so kids that do, that are connected with one of our site coordinators, um, really, they say that they're more, they feel more connected with adults. And they really do have a more positive relationship. We see it, we see it all the time. We see kids that'll maybe start the year um, not feeling very self-confident or not really sure of their place in the school and they get the support of the site coordinator and, and other adults in the building. Um, and by the middle or the end of the school year, they're feeling much more engaged and um, supported. Over the past five years, we've had some pretty good results. 97% um, of our seniors have graduated high school, and this is significant. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, but oftentimes the kids that are referred are the ones that are really struggling or they're kind of getting towards that point where they may consider dropping out. So they're short on credits or um, having behavioral issues or family issues. So the fact that um, being able to help support kids that are struggling and get a 97% of seniors that graduate, I think is, is pretty, uh, pretty important. So and you can kind of see the students that we serve. And I'm sure that many of you in your districts um, have the same demographic of students. So, you know, 85% of the students that we serve live in poverty, and we know the challenges that come with that. And so um, that's a, a big portion of the students that we serve. So where does mentoring fit in? Um, well, mentoring is a piece of what we do. When I, when I showed you the model of CIS, we talked about doing the needs assessment. And when the students are referred to, referred on an individual basis, and we sit down and make a student support plan, sometimes it's clear that that student really needs um, some, some ongoing individual support by a caring adult. And sometimes students are referred by a teacher or a counselor and they say, hey, we need a mentor, and that will kind of be the entry point for the student to get full wraparound services, or sometimes they're already receiving services and it's just clear that they need somebody to help support them on a regular basis. So that's how it fits in, it's a piece of what we do, but it's certainly an important uh, and a big piece of what we do. So we're gonna try one more poll. Uh, what percentage of young people in America do you think grow up without a mentor? And there's some options there. And so far we, um, we do have a question from our audience, thank you. Um, do you find it easier to implement in elementary school versus high school? What does that look like? Um, so is that specifically, oh, with, so with communities and schools, is it easier to implement yeah. in elementary? Yeah. Um, I would say yes. And we have been, um, currently in Federal Way, we are in middle school and high school, and that's a, a district um, initiative. But we have been in elementary schools as well. And I, I would say it is. Um, and I think um, there are many reasons, and you guys you know, probably aware of this, but the, the family engagement, kind of the family involvement piece, there's more of that in elementary. Um, also, kids are just happy to talk to you, you know? Um, and so I do, I do think it's easier in elementary school. Also. Okay, I'm gonna share these results so you guys can see them. Um, and so it looks like um, there were a lot of guesses around 60% or 75%. How does that look to you, Tracy? Well, it's actually 33%. So it, but I would, I would have probably said the same thing if I didn't know. It seems like there are a lot of kids that don't have a caring adult. I think when in, in, in this study, it was, um, it took into account informal mentors as well. So coaches, uh, youth pastors, things like that. Um, so that's kind of why I think it's a 33%, but I probably would have said the same thing too, because we know there are a lot of kids that, that, that don't have uh, their, their person. Yeah. And that's all the questions we have right now. Great. So, so like we said, one in three young people will go up without a mentor. And, and a mentor doesn't have to be a, a formal program. It can be, like I said, a coach or a youth pastor or an aunt or an uncle. Um, but we know that kids that are mentored, I mean, the, the data is clear. And I think we all know that kids that, are, that have a mentor are more likely to stay in school and graduate and less likely to get in trouble. 
Um, this mentor-mentee pair, this is Natalie, the mentor, and Connor, the mentee, and um, they've been together for quite some time. Connor's got quite a story, and Natalie's been there um, with him along the way. Uh, I think he's getting ready to graduate as well. So um, just one example of one of mentee pairs. And one of the things that we've seen as well has been shown in, the, in research is that one of the strongest benefits and most consistent across risk groups is a reduction of depressive systems. I think especially for us anyway, when the kids get in high school, those you really see kind of those um, depressive symptoms come out and being able to have somebody to talk to, somebody there on a regular basis, um, it makes a huge difference for that. There are a couple of different kinds, well, there are many different kinds of mentoring actually, and, and, but the, some of the common types of mentoring are just the one-to-one -one mentoring. I think that's probably most common. That's what that's mainly what we do. Um, there's also group mentoring. So an adult with maybe a group of five to 10 kids and they may have a specific focus um, or not. And but being able to support kind of all those kids in a group session and then cross age peer mentoring, which some of you probably have seen this like um, I think it, here anyway in high school, they'll match an incoming ninth grader with a senior. And that senior helps that ninth grader navigate, you know, coming into high school um, and meets with them on a regular basis as well. And I thought this was inter interesting. So across the country, who facilitates these mentoring program, programs? And 79% of the youth mentoring programs agents are, agencies are nonprofits. So organizations that specifically run mentoring programs, most of them are nonprofits. Um, only 9% are school districts and 6% are religious organizations. And this is Barney and his student. Barney's the mentor and he's uh, been with, with us for a while too. He was pretty cool. He got to take his student to a Seahawks game. Um, so those are some fun things that they can do um, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a match. There, most of the mentoring programs um, kind of, you know, it's really about the relationship, but sometimes they have a specific focus. Um, so some of the common program goals might be, um, well, clearly the, the relationship, but also they might need to work on life and social skill building, or you really might have a program that's a mentoring program, but it's um, focused on academics um, or leadership or college access. So um, it just kind of depends on how it's developed and what the focus is, what the need is in that community or in that school. And this is our mentor, Jenny, and her student. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see they just look like they're having a good time. So our program specifically, we started in 2006 at two middle schools with, it was our pilot year, um, and we had 10 kids, 10 matches, so 10 students and um, 10 adults, and that was at two schools, and now, like I said, we're in, well, here in February, we're in 11 schools, since then we've had over 500 matches, and many of our kids have gone on to graduate and in our college, um, so it's really, we've really had a lot of support from the community and from the school district to grow the program. Um, average match length is three years, which I think is significant as well. Um, the data shows that if matches end too soon, it actually can be harmful for the child. So we're really happy that our mentors tend to stay on. Um, our longest match has been there for seven years. Um, and we have mentors that'll, that'll take a kid through graduation and still be in touch and then start with another student um, just because they know how important it is and because um, they enjoy it too. So our program is a school-based mentoring program. Um, it's volunteer-based, so we go out into the community and we recruit at churches and businesses and festivals and wherever we can go and start talking about mentoring. Um, we, it's one hour, one day a week, and it's, it's actually not even really an hour because it's basically one class period or um, yeah, lunch or something like that. So. Um, we ask for a commitment of at least one year, and again, that comes back to the fact that we know that's really important to not um, make that relationship any shorter than that and actually, you know, have damage. So at least one year. Our hope is that once they get started, they'll continue year, year over year. Um, we saw that our average match is three years, but we've had matches that have started in fifth grade and gone through graduation. And that's really, it's, it's amazing to see that happen and the changes in a student um, during that time period. It's always during the school day, um, and that's a challenge because 
attendance is important, right? Kids need to be in class. So we try to work around that. Well, we do work around that the best we can. We, we don't take kids out of core classes. We'll try to use advisory if we can, lunch, um, things like that. That's, that's definitely one of the challenges, scheduling both for students and for the volunteers. And our program is based around really the emphasis on a caring adult relationship. It's, it's totally student driven. So whatever, basically whatever that kid needs, if they do need some help with homework, great, we can do that. If you're having trouble at home, let's talk about that. If you just want to play cards for the day and relax, okay. Um, it's really just showing up and being there and listening. And then our site coordinators, as I showed you in the model earlier, um, they are mentors as well. They are, they are mentors every day, pretty much, to their case managed students. Uh, but they also have uh, some kids as a formal mentor-mentee relationship that they meet with kind of outside of that scope, um, just those kids that really need that extra ongoing support. So there are creative ways um, to form uh, mentoring relationships, and uh, I think many, they're all beneficial. So for our program, um, you have to be at least 18 years of age. Um, the first thing somebody would do is complete an application. Um, we would then do a, um, actually we do an, a Washington State Patrol background check as well as a National Sex Offender Registry check. And as long as they check out, then we would do um, a quick interview. So if we'll bring them in and just make sure that, honestly, before you get even into training, just make sure that they understand what mentoring is and what it isn't. I think often coming into um, this role, um, people may have ideas of what they think it's going to be, and it may not necessarily be that. So, so kind of having that initial conversation, making sure that, that the volunteer understands really what the, the goal of the program is. We'll check their references, and then we start with a one and a half hour training. Um, and this can be done at the beginning of the year. It's usually several people at once, but as we go through the year and if we place mentors, you know, one on one to one, it'll be just a you know one to one training. So, um, and it really it covers it covers not only you know what mentoring is, what it isn't, you know some topics and ideas for kid for to talk with your kids about how to kind of get past if you're kind of stuck in that relationship, you feel like it's you're not really making a difference, as well as the actual logistics of our um, program, like you know don't exchange personal information and you can't meet outside of school and things like that. Um, so just make sure that uh, mentors understand um, the full scope of the program. So I was sorry to hear you guys didn't get to hear the first um, webinar this morning. Um, Mentor Washington who was doing that um, that that webinar is, is one of our partners and they were actually they were they had a different name when we first started our program but they were um, one of the places that we turned to look for the elements of effective practice in mentoring. Um, so we start with you know we recruitment and screening, um, you know, being strategic about your recruitment and finding places where you, um, especially if, if you find businesses or churches that really have um, a, a desire to be part of the community and to give back, um, that's a good place to start. The customized training, that was kind of what I was talking about before, you know, what are the particulars to your specific program, as well as what does it mean to be a mentor and what are some things I can do to support my student. Targeted matching, and I think this is really important. Uh, getting a good match is just crucial to um, keeping them ongoing, to, to making them last longer, as well as really um, the student having a good experience. And then the ongoing support and monitoring. Sometimes, at, at least in a school-based program, the, um, the mentor's there, and they, are, they go to the school once a week, and they may not see any other mentors or, or have any other interaction, and so, I think it's critical to have the ongoing support and communication um, from the CIS staff, from the site coordinator, and just make sure that they know that they're not alone and they have um, help and support if they need it or if, if they have any questions. Another important piece of the mentor program is mentor recognition. We want to make sure that our volunteers feel appreciated, um, that they know how much that um, what, how important they are that we couldn't do this program without them. So we'll do various th things throughout the years. Um, we've done, we take photos of the mentor mentee and then we put them in little frames and give them to them. Um, we'll do thank you cards and have the kids sign them and give them to their mentor. We do thank you events. Um, since it's National Mentoring Month, every year we do some sort of celebration and it's been kind of different over the years. We've 
gone bowling, we've gone to a movie, we've just um, had pizza. So this year we have a one of our local business people who's a good a great community partner, um, Sub Zero Ice Cream. He does makes ice cream with nitrogen. And so he's going to come in and we bring in mentors and mentees and he's going to do a demonstration and then everybody gets ice cream. So that will be fun. And at the end of the year, we give all the mentors a certificate, just a certificate of appreciation and the kids sign them and usually write a little something on there. Um, we've done phone calls from principals. So talking to principals and just, you know, emphasizing these are volunteers that are coming into your building that are supporting you guys in the work that you're doing and meeting with kids and, and the principals appreciate that. And so, um, they have called personally and thanked our mentors, which actually has been really, was really significant, I think. Um, and then, of course, social media, we, you know, put stories, um, you know, and, and that's a great way, too, for recruitment. If I think if people see these stories, um, they may understand it a little bit better. I, I think that's one of the things about recruitment is people are afraid because they don't really know what it is. So hopefully by some of the stories and what they see on social media, um, they, they, they are, might be more interested in it. So this is Eileen, and she was one of our, like I said, our original um, members. She was on the board, um, or original mentors. She was on the board when they started the mentoring program and um, has been doing it ever since then. So 12 years? Yeah. <laughs> At least, yeah. yeah. And has had several different kids that she has mentored throughout the years, is still mentoring with us. Um, and I'm going to, she's going to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of what that was like starting the program and then what mentoring's like, and maybe give you the perspective from the, the mentor. Eileen? So I'm, I'm Eileen Carnahan, and I have been with communities and schools now, probably in one form or another since about 2000, when it started. And I was on the Education Foundation back in 2002 and um, was actually on the advisory board that helped decide to bring communities and schools and make it um, communities and schools instead of the education foundation in federal way. Um, had a lot of support around that and uh, our biggest thing that we did when we first started was really mentoring and we put quite a lot of um, time, it took a lot of time, we did a lot of training manuals, uh, really had to talk and you know partner with the schools really make them understand what we wanted to do. And uh, so I was actually one of the first mentors at Sacagawea and with a young lady. And oh, that only lasted a year because she did end up leaving the district. So after that, which, and it was very interesting, it was kind of a, kind of our pilot program at that point. We decided to continue with it. And um, then we decided to do the group mentoring that Tracy mentioned before. And I started group mentoring with a group of fifth grade girls and they were there just based on mostly maybe uh, behavior d different things that they saw they grouped them together and I was with them all of fifth grade I transitioned three of them into middle school one left the district and got them through the horrible years of middle school <laughs> and all the traumas that come through that and um, and it was great group mentoring is a very different dynamic the kids um, can really uh, play off each other a little bit to really kind of support each other, especially if one's maybe feeling, um, you know, if there was some bullying or if there was just something that was going on in the schools. They kind of it created kind of a little bit of a support mechanism for the three girls, and they were very, very different girls. By um, high school, I transitioned over to high school with them. Uh, one of the young ladies, very, very bright, went into AVID, and she did not have time to be able to be mentored. And one of the reasons she was mentoring was really, it was a maturity issue. And she was, she had really progressed, so she was comfortable with not continuing the mentoring. The other two I mentored um, <clears throat> through some interesting problems through high school, especially for girls. And then um, the last two years, junior and senior year, uh, I just had the one because the other girl, also very bright, went to Running Start, and I'm happy to say graduated and is going to CLU. And uh, she's, yeah, she's been doing really well. And then the last one is the one that you're seeing on the screen. And she um, came from some problem background a little bit and um, is the only um, child in their family who's graduated from college, uh, high school, sorry. 
and her sisters were at uh, the same high school and it all dropped out for various reasons. And her mother um, is an, is illegal and um, had, yeah, and she uh, didn't speak English much at all. And um, I'd met her on a couple of occasions and she was very thankful that I was there to help her kind of navigate through some of the things that is, are hard for her to navigate in high school, whether it's forms, as she was applying, she decided to apply for a couple of internships. So I, she used me as a recommendation. We went to the computer lab a couple of times to help her fill out job applications. Um, she was applying for uh, kind of a certificate program after high school. She really didn't have the funds to be able to go to college. And um, so she, she ended up graduating, which was a I was I went was able to go to their graduation and her whole family was there and they were so proud of her and she was really proud of herself and she was going to be working and going into a certificate program and so she's doing really great and uh, so then I kind of took some time off, well like maybe four months off and then I got a call that they needed someone to mentor somebody something had come up at the school so we ended up. Um, we ended so I've ended up going back over and mentoring another girl at the same high school right now and uh and I continue to do it because I really do see what difference it makes for them but also even for me I I it's a it's a very rewarding experience um I get the opportunity to I kind of work with kids that you know they just don't have a lot of um strong adult influences in their lives Things that we might take for granted that we tell our own children, they, they're just not told that. And so for me, when I'm able to help, you know, do a college application or help, you know, whatever they might need, it's, it's just really fulfilling for me. I feel, I feel at the end of the day that I've done something. And like I said, for my two that graduated this year, I, I, it, I was as proud as when my own children graduated. It's a, it's a great feeling. And um, I, you know, would highly recommend it. In fact, I've referred a couple people and, and they now mentor and they love it. And um, I don't think it's a big time crunch. And usually it's the biggest thing, like Tracy said, was it's hard to find the time that works with the students, especially in high school. Um, and um, I personally, somebody had asked if it's easier to mentor in high school versus the younger kids. In my opinion, it's much easier to start when they're younger because mentoring is a trust building exercise, a lot of it. And when they're younger, like Tracy said, they're more open to talking. And you know, when they're younger, you play games, you just, you kind of, you know, do little activities. Once they're in high school, they're a little past that. It's a little bit more difficult to gain trust. Teenagers in general are a little bit more closed off anyway. So um, I, I definitely would recommend starting younger than later but uh, yeah but for me I like I said I I think it's a great it's a great program not because I was part of it but also um, I I just personally have seen what it can do for kids and and has done a lot for me so and Eileen mentioned you know watching her kids graduate and that's one thing that's super exciting for our mentors when they have a student that that's graduating they often go to the graduation and watch them walk across the stage and they're crying just like the parents are and it's just such a such a proud moment when they get to do that it's emotional the only other thing i was going to say is i continue to stay with the communities and schools and i'm now on the state board and i'm the chair of what communities and schools of washington state and you know federal way is doing an amazing job with this program and we have some all over the state so specifically about our <clears throat> mentoring program, some of the lessons learned, um, we learned that the very intentional recruitment and matching is really important. So one of the things that we do when we uh, are, are matching um, an adult and a student is we have each one of them do a kind of a, a personality profile or an interest kind of um, fill out an interest survey. And then, then we try to find places where they match. Do they have hobbies in common or interests in common or have they done things you know in the past that they can talk to each other about so and I, I really think that is one of the most important things is making a good match it's hard and, and it's happened to us over the over the years occasionally you'll get one you're like this just isn't a good fit 
Um, but I think really putting some time and effort into the matching, that's one of the most important things. When we started, we also, we went, uh, we started in a feeder pattern, so elementary, middle, and high school, and what happened was by the time we got to high school, there was such an overload because kids came from a couple different middle schools that you had a high school that had, you know, 30 matches, um, which is a lot to coordinate when our site coordinators are already doing all kinds of other things. So we worked to kind of spread that out a little bit more over the district. Um, and then one thing that's really important is to make sure you have enough time for recruitment. Um, because of um, kind of the transient nature of our families here in Federal Way, uh, every year we decrease matches by about a third. Part of that is students leaving the, the community. Part of that is mentors moving on or whatever. And so um, every year we have to work to get more new matches and stuff. We have about 100 a year, kind of on a steady basis, but that's it's also kind of turnover and new people. And then um, like Eileen, we might have mentors that'll be do, do it for several years and then sit out for a year and then come back. Um, but you really need to kind of be strategic about your recruitment and then also make sure that you have enough time. Like for example, we're recruiting now for next school year. So in January, we start having those conversations, um, you know, especially people that over the years, oh, I wanna do it, but I wanna wait. So we follow up with them, you know, can you start in September? Um, so, so you really need to spend some, some significant time doing that. So this is one of our, this is one of our great success stories, one of many actually but they were featured um, in our local paper, paper here. That's um, Brett's the mentor and David's the mentee. And David's story is that he came from a really difficult kind of family life and didn't have much support. His family expected him to work to support the family. That's what they needed and that's what he did. And there was a point in the high school when his mother asked, actually asked him to drop out so he could continue working and support the family. And Brett, um, understanding that this was important to David's family, and they just worked together to figure out how could he continue to do what he needed for his family, as well as um, graduate from high school. And so David graduated last year, and he's at Central this year, and he and Brett are still um, in communication. I think that's one of the things that's powerful about these mentoring relationships, that I hear this um, not just with our program, but other mentoring programs too, you know, as they, as your kids transition into adulthood, being able to have that ongoing relationship. Um, David calls Brett when he's feeling homesick, they get to see each other over the holidays. So they both really believe that they'll be in each other's lives, um, you know, forever. So um, great, great uh, story there. Kathy, were you going to do another poll? Um, yeah, we'll do that in just a minute. We do have a question from the audience. Okay. Uh, Alex um, is asking, he is the president and CEO of a Washington State charitable organization, and they serve students and military families. He's wondering about how you communicate just the power and the value of mentoring and social emotional learning um, when a lot of schools are kind of focused around that academic stuff instead. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, I, I feel fortunate here in Federal Way because there really is a focus on whole child. Yes, academics, clearly, that's, you know, why the kids are here, but they also understand that the approach has to be whole child. Um, but there were, you know, some years uh, in the past where it's been a little bit before we had different superintendent, uh, it's been more of a struggle. I think, you know, really it starts with the data. I mean, there's just, it shows you that, um, you know, if kids' basic needs aren't met, if they're not getting that social emotional support, they're not going to be able to learn. They're, the academics, you know, aren't aren't going to be there. Um, so I think that's kind of where it starts, and then and then just the ongoing conversation. Um, you know, how can I how can a kid sit in class and learn? You know, when they're hungry, how can they go to class when their parent was put in jail last night and they need somebody to talk to? So having those conversations. Um, helping, helping, you know, whether it's the administration or the teachers to understand that, yeah, you want this kid in class too. We, our job is to help this, support this student, do what we need to do and get them back in class. But if they don't have that support, then most likely they're going to be sitting in class and not really learning. Yeah. 
And we had another question come in. Um, do you suggest mentors discuss attendance and or grades with mentees, or is it better to avoid those topics? I think it really depends. We do, our mentors do, um, they don't have direct access, but they can talk to our site coordinators and say, hey, how's my kid doing? Grades, you know, attendance, um, or they just talk to their student about it. But um, I think it, it just really depends. If, if, you, if you see that your student is missing a lot of, you know, time, you know, as you show up and your kid's not there and stuff, then yeah, I think it warrants the question, you know, kind of what's going on. And usually what we find is then it leads to some discussion about what's the barrier, you know, why is that, that student not getting to school? Um, and then academics is kind of the same, you know, my student, Ruby, she never wants to talk about, about <laughs> grades or classes or stuff. She wants to talk about boys and she wants to talk about her relationships and that kind of thing. And so um, I do check to make sure, um, but it's really not what she needs from me. We have had um, mentor, mentee pairs over the years where they have really focused strongly on academics because that's what the student needs. So I, what we try to say is it's like, we don't, we don't talk to kids about what we want to talk to them about. We talk to them and listen to them and it helps support them in finding their way with what they need to hear. If that makes sense. Awesome. And um, we don't have any other questions in the poll yet. Oh wait, nope, we've had a couple more come in. Um, has your program intentionally connected to eighth graders transitioning to high school and keeping ninth graders on track? We have, and, and that's a great question. Um, so one of the things, so here in Federal Way, um, I mentioned, so the district's initiative is to have us, we were in all the middle schools and all the high schools. And so the beauty of that is then I have staff that work with eighth graders and I have staff that work with ninth graders, you know, that work the transition. And so we are very intentional about that transition time. Towards the end of the school year, we'll take the, our case managed kids will go from, you know, the, the coordinator from middle school, will take them up to the high school introduce them to the person, show them around. And I, and I know they get those, they get to do that through the school as well, but this is specifically so they can meet this person. So they know when I get to ninth grade, this is my person, the same person that I had, you know, Miss Pat in eighth grade. Now I have, you know, Miss T in, you know, um, ninth grade. And they've got a friendly face when they get there. And they're automatically, unless things have changed, they're automatically added to the caseload of the, of the ninth grade site coordinator. Um, so definitely, that's that's a super important time. Um, we did get another question from Keiko. Uh, what does training look like for mentors? Also, what kinds of ongoing support is provided? So training is, um, like I said, we it's a, about an hour and a half or so. Um, it's um, we they have a training manual, and we go over. Um, we start really with kind of what is mentoring and what what mentoring is not. Um, and I'm happy to share those materials with anybody if, if they want them. I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, it's not a secret or anything. Um, but really, I think, um, like I said, we get a lot of people that come in with like preconceived ideas what mentoring is. Um, and we really want to get them on the right path. So, so for example, and I'm just going to say it, we have some people that feel like they want to, I want to come in because I want to fix a kid. And we're like, that's not why we're here. That's not what we're doing. And so you have to make sure that they understand what, why you're here for, for the kid, not so you get something out of it, you know? Um, so we really work on that. We give them some specific, you know, um, uh, conversation starters. Here are some things that you can talk about here. Here's the life cycle of a mentoring relationship because that first year you often don't even feel like you're the, you know, the kid cares if you're there or not. And we, 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 mentors all the time I will call up and say I don't even know why I'm doing this and we just encourage them to stick with it because we know that they're building trust just by showing up they're building trust and um, when they come back next year that's going to make a huge impact so talk a little bit about that and then we also talk about like I said with our program anyway because it's school-based we don't want the mentors to have any contact outside of the school with the kids so we make sure that they know that they're not supposed to exchange emails, um, cell phone, you know, texting, things like that. Um, we also make sure that they understand that this is a relationship between them and the student and not the parents. Um, and just, you know, other things like that. Like I said, I'm happy to, happy to, to share that with you. The ongoing support, um, we 
we do a couple of different things. So our, our site coordinators, because they're there at the school, they check in with the mentors, you know, on an ongoing basis. They see actually every time a mentor comes in, the site coordinator will see them and just check in. How's it going? What you doing? Um, and then we also offer um, what we call our brown bag kind of sessions uh, about every quarter or maybe twice a year. We try to get mentors together and just kind of have a casual brown bag lunch and they can talk to each other. Um, and we found that very helpful. They like, you know, what are you doing? What's going on? What are your challenges? Um, and that's been, I think, really good too. So to just to get folks together, just to kind of just talk about what's going on. Um, and we had another question. Um, how much of an issue has mental health and substance abuse issues impacted your youth? Have you had a hard time finding community resources to address this? Uh, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, absolutely. The, the, the drug issues and then the, the drug use issues and the mental health issues are big. And yes, we often have a hard time finding resources. Um, I just had this conversation with my staff the other day. Um, I think, um, you know, we do partner with some local organizations that come in and actually do mental health, um, uh, mental health um, meetings with kids, um, counseling with kids at the school. Um, we also have organizations that are um, drug and alcohol abuse um, centers that, that come in and work with the kids. We, you know, we really, we really try to focus on prevention, which I think is important, but clearly um, you have a lot of times when you need to support the kid kind of after the fact. So, but yeah, as far as resources, it's, it's hard. Um, I feel like lately there are, there's kind of been a bigger focus on that. So we're seeing a little bit more resources but it definitely is an issue and the, the mental health piece of it um, is just tough so many of our kids have have come to us um, having dealt with trauma and um, that's just a, it's a really tough tough place to be and it's a tough uh, tough thing to sometimes be able to find the right resource or the right service to help support that kid or their family um, another question for you um, do school staff service mentors uh, they have, yes, actually we do have some school staff uh, as mentors um, and here in Federal Way, the district actually has a, a mentoring program as well. Um, it's a different focus, um, but they do, so a lot of their staff participate in that one, but we also have some different district staff that um, want to do our program instead because of the focus that it has. So, so yeah, over the years it's kind of in and out, but yeah, it's, and it's great when they do. Um, Sometimes they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, I already have this informal mentor relationship. Let's make it part of the program, you know, and, and actually track it, that kind of thing. Um, another question for you. Um, do you have any advice on how to get parents to engage? Any tricks for getting families to return permission slips um, for their kids to participate? I know that's an issue sometimes. That is one of the biggest issues, per <laughs> uh, permission slips. Um, you know, we go around and around and around about this, and I think it's just, you know, constantly trying to find new ways. Um, the, the, one of the things I think that's one of the, has gotten us some of the most success is actual just phone calls to parents saying, you know, we sent this permission slip home. Can you send it? Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you what we're doing. Uh, when we can, when we can do that. Um, you know, sometimes the kids will be, sometimes the kids will be coming in and, and, wanting to talk to our site coordinator and getting snacks and things like that. And there's a point where we have to say, look, if you don't get this signed, you can't come do this anymore. And that, you know, sounds harsh, but it's like, okay, the, the, the child, the student understands this is, this is, I really need to do this, you know, and then, and then delve into the deeper relationship. So um, I've had coordinators who have, you know, done incentives, you know, bring your permission slip back and you get this candy or this, you know, special treat or something. Um, this is nationally for our or our organization. I'm sure many others. It is. It's an issue, and we just keep trying, keep trying, whatever we can, keep trying. <laughs> do you do like home visits ever? Is that a um, possibility? We or? home visits really aren't part um, specifically of what we do. We do home visits. We accompany, like if the district staff is going to do a home visit, but typically it doesn't have to do anything with getting permission slips. You know, it's a, it's a deeper issue. So. Um, it's, it's phone calls, it's emails, it's, you know, sending as much communication home with students um, and just, just doing the best you can. And sometimes, you know, we just get to a point where we go, okay, clearly this isn't going to happen. And we just continue to serve the student as best we can without being able to really, you know, dive in, dive in deep, unfortunately. Um, 
Um, hmm. Awesome stuff. I think that's the end of our questions at this point. So I think we're going to launch our, our evaluation for people. Um, so looking at that. Um, so at um, Gate Webinar, we care a lot about our audience and we really want to know what you're thinking. So we're trying a new strategy um, for this webinar and we're just thinking about um, how do people uh, experience it and we just want to know what you're thinking out there so we get a little bit more information to make some changes and make sure that you're getting the most out of it that you can. Um, we're totally open to your feedback as well so if there's something um, that you took away from this webinar we'd love to see that in the chat and any action steps if this webinar helped you uh, with starting your mentoring program or thinking about next steps um, we'd love to see those in the chat also <coughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, hey, Kefi. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's the that's the slide I wanted them to see. So. Mm -hmm. And we do want to get some resources. Do you want to talk about this one? Yeah. Right. So, Mentor Washington, uh, which is an, uh, an organization that really supports all the mentoring organizations across state, um, they've got a lot of great resources. Like I said, we went to them when we were starting ours. They're also happy to come out and help um, and, and answer any questions. So, they're a great resource. And if you're interested in more information about communities and schools, um, take a look at our website, siswa.org. That's our state office. And they're really the, when you're starting a new affiliate or if you want to do something new, they're the ones you go through. So a um, couple of resources for you. Um, and hopefully those will get your questions answered. And if anybody wants to email me, that's fine too. Happy to answer any more questions. Awesome. <coughs> And thank you guys so much for coming and presenting with us today. You're excellent speakers, and we so appreciate hearing about your program. Um, in yeah, case thanks for having us. Um, last month's webinar was also on mentoring. So we had Melissa Charette, who was ESD 113's Teacher of the Year last year. Um, she <coughs> talked about her mentoring program in Washington Middle School, where um, she set it up for mentoring students with disabilities. So if that's something that you want to work on, it's a great resource for you as well. And then this morning, if you were joining us um, for this morning and you couldn't get in, we're working on rescheduling that for later this month. So we're hoping that we can still bring you that great content about Mentoring 101 from Mentor Washington. Um, next month, we are going to have more webinars in February. So February 13th, we're going to be looking at English learners and dual credit and elementary approaches as well. Most of our images come from Canva and the Noun Project. So if you loved um, the Communities and Schools slide template, that's from Canva. Totally beautiful work there. We will see you next month and we'll hang out for just a few more minutes to monitor the chat and any last minute questions and um, we'll be here.